So, now let us see uh, if we can understand uh, how to follow solvent dynamics using ultrafast spectroscopy and as we are going to discuss by the end of this module uh, this sometimes uh, solvation can be ultra slow as well and fast or slow uh, study of solvation dynamics can uh, give us some useful and interesting information. So, the way one studies uh, solvation dynamics is you start from what we had discussed earlier. You start with a molecule which has near 0 dipole moment and you excite it and the molecule should be such that there is a charge transfer in the excited state, ultra fast charge transfer. So, this is the situation in the ground state, your molecule with no dipole moment and uh, solvent molecules are oriented in whatever way they are oriented in around them around the solute molecule. Upon excitation charge transfer has to take place. Now, this excitation takes place in uh, ultra fast time scale at a second. That is not enough time for the solvent molecules to reorient that is what I think Prajit was saying in the earlier module. Then given enough time the solvent dipoles would reorient around the uh, two poles of the newly created solute dipole and you would get a happy situation like this. And as we have discussed due to favorable dipole dipole interaction you are going to get a stabilization of the excited state. Now, see in case this molecule is fluorescent then what is the situation? If we can record uh, emission spectra at different times after excitation and we have discussed earlier in this course how one can do that. One can do it either by uh, gated emission or one can record uh, steady state and time resolved data and construct the uh, time resolved emission spectrum from there. We are going to uh, come back to that in a moment, but the point is at time t equal to 0 you get emission at some particular maximal frequency as time passes there is going to be a red shift because the energy gap between the ground state and the excited st excited state and the ground state would keep decreasing because of stabilization of the ground state and the fact that the corresponding excited state is of higher energy than the uh, state that we actually excited the unsolvated state this is something we discussed in the previous module. So, what you get is a time resolved stoke shift time dependent stoke shift TDSS as it called of the emission spectrum. So, in this case one works with the uh, maximum uh, emission maximum of this time resolved emission spectra and from there we construct this solvent response function C of t which is given as nu at time t nu means uh, as you said the maximum of emission spectrum at time t minus the emission maximum at time infinity. Time infinity means uh, you do not really have to measure up to time infinity. It means the time after which there is no further stoke shift and that is a contentious issue. I will come back to that in a moment. Uh, denominator is nu 0 minus nu infinity when nu 0 is the emission maximum at the instant of excitation nu infinity is what we have discussed already. Now, see what are the problems associated with this how do you know nu, nu 0 how do you know nu infinity that is what the problem is. Because if the lifetime is say in tens of nanoseconds lifetime of the uh, excited state and solvation time is some 1 picosecond 2 picosecond then there is no problem. Because you would go from the higher energy unsolvated state to the completely stabilized state which will persist for a few nanoseconds. So, you get nu infinity without hassle. The problem arises if solvation time is comparable to the lifetime which we are going to show is the case in many cases. Then you do not know whether solvate, solvation is complete or not. If solvation is not complete within the time scale of the measurement then nu infinity is not determined accurately that is one problem. The second problem is how do you determine nu 0. The easiest way of doing it is uh, well to fit the decays to uh, multi exponential fitting functions 
and then construct the time resolved emission intensities by putting t equal to 0. Now, there is a problem with that. The problem there is what is the time resolution of your experiment? What is the instrument response function? If you are going to do, uh, if you can excite with an attosecond pulse, attosecond detection and do this experiment perhaps you will get the accurate value of nu 0 every time. Otherwise, uh, nu 0 is subject to errors uh, associated with the full width half maximum of instrument response function. Now, different people have proposed different ways of determining nu 0, all of them have some uh, pros and some cons. One way of determining nu 0 sometimes is people have considered the uh, emission spectrum in nonpolar solvents now that may or may not be correct because even the ground state energy may not be exactly the same the energy gap between uh, the uh, ground state and the locally excited state may or may not be the same between polar and nonpolar solvents as first approximation they are but uh, not always another way that has been done is that uh, the solvent has been frozen and you perform measurements at uh, liquid nitrogen temperature. This seems to yield a good result because when, when the solvent is frozen, then there will be no reorientation. So, you look at the uh, same uh, excited state that you are going to excite anyway. Uh, the only hesitation about that is that the polarity of the medium as we have see, seen for DMABN can be temperature dependent. So, no method is 100 percent foolproof, you have to work within uh, whatever limitation it might have. Okay. Now, let us come back to this fraction itself, what does it denote nu t minus nu at t minus nu at infinity divided by nu at 0 minus nu at infinity, what is the significance of this fraction? Okay, nu 0 minus nu infinity, what is that? That is a total stoke shift. What is nu t minus nu infinity? Stokes shift that is yet to happen. So, this fraction C of t is the fraction of solvation that is yet to happen. Okay. Uh, as has been discussed very nicely in this golden paper, it has been cited I do not know how many thousand times. It is a very famous paper by Bakchi, Oxtobi, and Fleming, 1987. What they have discussed is that uh, due to linear response theory, in the simplest case scenario, you expect the C of t to decay exponentially. However, most of the time you do not get a simple exponential decay, you get something like this, okay. because there are different modes of solvation that are there. It is not a very simple phenomenon. As we are going to uh, present very briefly uh, about water there are different things that happen. That is why you usually do not get, there are cases in which you get single exponential as we are going to show, but many times you do not get a simple single exponential decay of your uh, solvent response function. So, generally C of t is fitted as a multi exponential function and each of the time constants is called a solvation time. And the challenge is, is it possible to assign each of this solvation time to some kind of a mode of motion of the solvent molecule. Okay. So, let me show you some example of time dependent stroke shift data from our own lab. Here, what do you expect? If solvation takes place, then you expect we have talked about uh, what the signature of uh, an excited state process is. In this case, solvation is taking place of the excited state. So, it is also an excited state process. So, you expect a fast decay in the blue end which uh, corresponds to the in this case unsolvated locally excited state and you expect a rise time in the red end because that corresponds to the uh, solvated excited state that is being formed. So, this is a typical kind of curve that you would expect. So, what you do is you fit this kind of a uh, time resolved fluorescence data to multi exponential function and you generate the intensity at some particular uh, 
wave number by i nu bar s s multiplied by sum over i a i e to the power minus t by tau i divided by sum over i a i tau i. It comes from the fact that uh, what is this i nu bar s s that is the emission intensity at a particular uh, wave number. Now, uh, emission intensity at a particular wave number is essentially integral of time resolved intensity from uh, 0 to infinity. It comes from there, it is a standard integral which turns out to be sum over i a i tau i which is the uh, total intensity and you get this kind of an expression. Now, uh, when you do this, you are going to get time resolved emission intensities for different frequencies and when you plot them against frequency for different times, you get this kind of a picture. This is an example of uh, time resolved emission spectra and here we see from our lab an example of how C of t changes with time. You can see it decays, but it does not decay single exponentially. One thing you can see, we have not told you what the molecule here, molecule is here, it does not really matter, but one thing you can see is that the uh, solvation is faster, at least a long component of solvation is faster for methanol than for 1 propanol. The uh, reason is understandable, uh, 1 propanol is more viscous than methanol. So, uh, similarly, there can be many other reasons many other factors that can influence solvation dynamics. Okay. So, to start with uh, let us talk about solvation dynamics in uh, non aqueous solvents. Of course, non aqueous solvents can uh, be classified into two parts aprotic solvent and alcohol. In 1987 uh, from Fle Graham, Fleming, Graham Fleming's group has made significant contribution uh, to the field of solvation dynamics and not only Fleming his students who later on went on to become independent researchers, they have also done significant work. So, you can think Fleming school comprising Kastner, Maranchelli, all these people have contributed big time. The other players are Mark Berg, well of course, was a Biman Bhakti, was a Kankan Bhattacharya, these people have done a lot of work. Ahmed Zuel towards after getting Nobel Prize got interested in the field of, Nobel, of solvation dynamics, we will not really talk about his work here but you can read it and there are many groups in India which who have studied this. Uh, Nancy Levinger has done significant work on solvation dynamics in things like reverse micelles. So, uh, that is something that I leave uh, for you to read yourselves. It is a very interesting uh, body of literature that has been created uh, starting from say 1985-1987 until now a new infinity has not been reached even now plenty of work is going on using solvation dynamics. So, this particular work on the Kastner, Maranchelli and Fleming used uh, this uh, kind of a probe and let me show you the decays, uh, fluorescence decays in DMSO. So, as you see in the blue end 570 nanometer, you have a fast decay that almost gets over within 30 picosecond. The red end of the spectrum 730 nanometer, you see a distinct rise and here you see a long lived excited state that is the solvated state that is being formed. Okay. So, this is uh, the uh, signature of solvation that we were talking about. From there they constructed the time resolved emission spectrum and here uh, in this early work they did not really uh, bother working out C of t, they simply plotted nu at time t against t as you understand you can rearrange that uh, equation right and you can uh, still get solvation time and these are the solvation uh, parameters that they obtain. So, as you see for acetonite trial linear response theory holds very nicely there is a single exponential decay associated with a 0 0.4 400 femtosecond decay sorry that is for acetonite trial. For DMSO is the same thing but the decay is slower 3.1 picosecond. So, you see uh, acetonitrile and DMS, so are they protic, aprotic, what kind of solvents are they? Both are aprotic solvents. Still, there is an almost order of magnitude difference in solvation time that depends on the polarity of the solvent by and large. So, here you see a signature of polarity. Then, when you go to nitrobenzene, uh, 
things get a little more complicated because you get a double exponential nature of decay. First one is 3.4, 2.3 is I think calculated theoretically and second one is 6.3 picosecond. So, if you look at nu bar infinity and you better look at nu 0 minus nu infinity here also you see a lot of difference. I think this is in thousands of centimeter inverse or something. This one is 1200, this is 770, this is 1080. So, even the extent of stabilization not just dynamics depends on the solvent and even that has a story to tell. From there the moment you go to protic solvents methanol has a 3.3 nanosecond single exponential solvation time, butanol has a 66 the AC nanosecond 3.3 picosecond, 66 picosecond and 100 picosecond. So, uh, of course, for butanol which is a more uh, viscous solvent you get slower solvation times and due to viscosity different kinds of modes get decoupled and that is why you see not one, but two different solvation times. Uh, this is only one example of solvation in aprotic solvents. Manoncelli especially has done a very thorough job. I remember this JCP paper of 1994 or 95, where I think there were several probes and like 30, 40 solvents. So, of that paper, I think four pages of that paper were just tables, tables like this, this is a small table. So, uh, exhaustive work has been done in uh, non aqueous solvents to understand the factors that contribute to solvation dynamics, polarity, viscosity, hydrogen bonding, everything matters. And having done this, the next question that was asked is what about solvation dynamics in water? Now, this is a very uh, important and fundamental question that has been dealt with uh, significantly after the report that I am going to show you, because after all uh, the entire life is based on water, right. So, understanding what happens in water uh, is an interesting question that has persisted and water is not a simple liquid, right. Sometimes Figuratively, we say something is as simple as water, that is a completely wrong sentence scientifically. Perhaps we should say as simple as hot water, because in hot water some hydrogen bonds are broken. Water itself is an abnormal liquid, as we all know, it should not have been a liquid in the first place, because H2S is a gas, oxygen and sulfur, oxygen is lighter. The reason why water is liquid is hydrogen bond. So, all the life processes are dependent on this uh, extraordinary liquid that is water. Uh, it is important to study solvation dynamics in water in many different forms. So, the first report of this came in 1994 once again from Graham Fleming's group and the importance of this work is highlighted in the fact that it was published in nature. Here similar TDSS studies were performed using Kumarin 343. So, this is this has become one of the most used fluorescence probes after this study. Okay. So, there are Kumarin 120 is 1, 343 is 1. So, using this Fleming and co-workers got this kind of time resolved uh, because this is all uh, femtosecond optical gating experiment. Okay. You can see fast decay in the blue end, rise in the red end and you can note the full scale of the experiment 2 picosecond. Of course, this is a zoomed in picture, they did do the experiment for much longer time. And having done this, they obtained the uh, C of t and saw how it uh, evolves in time. There is a lot of data in this. We are only giving you an overview. The expectation is that you are going to read this. This paper is extremely important, should be read in detail. I am not presenting the, even the numbers here. So, here this is the experimental time evolution of C of t. And the other things that you see are theoretical fit and all that. And this is how the oscillation takes place that is shown using molecular dynamics. So, crux of the matter is that it is multi exponential. In fact, there is an initial Gaussian component, it is not exponential all the way. And what uh, Fleming and co workers did in this paper is that using experiment as well as molecular dynamics, they could uh, attribute the uh, different solvation times 
to different kinds of motion of water, reorientation, liberation. What is the meaning of liberation? Liberation means restricted rotation. So, remember when we take water in isolation that is what we are used to thinking. Uh, it is just H O H, but water is not present in isolation in its liquid state as we know it is an associated liquid there are hydrogen bonds. So, when a water molecule tries to rotate very often what happens is this hydrogen bond with the next water molecule call hinders the rotation it cannot rotate all the way it comes back. So, that becomes a kind of an oscillatory motion which is identified as a low frequency vibration and motion it is not really rotating this kind of a motion back and forth. So, that of course, has uh, energy that is much more than rotational motion, but uh, significantly less compared to vibrational motions. In the next module, we will actually show you the spectrum of water IR spectrum, where uh, you will see uh, what kind of wave numbers are associated with this liberation. So, these different modes of water how they contribute to solvation that is what was worked out in this paper please read it. So, this was 1994 the next year the same group Fleming's group published a paper in Faraday journal of chemical society Faraday transaction. So, what they showed did the experiment they did there is that they took two probes C 343 and C 420 and they performed the experiment not in uh, just water but in uh, cyclodextrin in, in aqueous cyclodextrin solution. Okay. Cyclodextrin as we might have said earlier I do not remember if we have is a macromolecule that looks like an ice cream cup without a bottom. And the reason why cyclodextrin is interesting is that the out, outer surface of cyclodextrin is polar the in, inner surface is nonpolar. So, it can be used to solubilize nonpolar uh, solutes in water nonpolar molecules in water it is used very frequently in drug formulation and all that. So, in cyclodextrin Fleming's group found that solvation gets slowed down significantly. This is a comparison of the time evolution of C of t between water and cyclodextrin and these are the associated solvation times. So, you see that in addition to the picosecond component that was there first of all they did not observe a uh, less than picosecond component this was a TCSVC experiment. And more importantly hundreds of picosecond component and in one case what they observed as a nanosecond component came in. So, you have slowing down of solvation by an order of magnitude and this paper sparked a uh, series of work that has resulted in publication of I do not know how many thousand of paper. Half of my PhD thesis was inspired by this one paper. Uh, so, the explanation initially was actually not correct. What everybody thought was that you have bound water and free water. So, free water rotates uh, quickly, free water moves quickly and contributes to the fast component of solvation bound water moves slowly and contributes to the slow component of solvation that is not quite right. As has been elucidated later mainly by the group of professor Biman Bakshi, there is a dynamic equilibrium remember I talked about dynamic exchange of solvents in the previous module or maybe in this module. Uh, so, what they showed is that the bound water is actually you can think frozen it does not participate in solvation as such. However, there is a dynamic exchange between bound and free water. It is always the free water that uh, is reorienting around the newly created dipole moment, but there is an exchange and if you uh, remember uh, your lessons from chemical kinetics, if there is some equilibrium associated with that you have to take that into account the forward and backward rate constant. And this exchange is what is associated with the slow component of water. Uh, that is uh, something that is that came out very nicely in this Nandi Bhakti theory and this is the cartoon representation of let us say a protein to which water is hydrogen bonded and here you have the regular network of free water. There is a dynamic equilibrium between bound and free water when they considered that 
that is when they could arrive at this long solvation time. So, if you look at the energies this is the situation for free water this is the situation for bound water there is a barrier crossing back and forth this k 1 and k 2 have to be considered when you build the kind the kinetic scheme for solvation that is what causes slow solvation. Okay. So, now let me take a detour with this from the main agenda of the course the title of our course is ultra fast processes. Now, we have arrived at something that is not ultra fast which is not ultra slow maybe, but definitely not ultra fast slow. And the question to be asked is so what I mean why would we even be interested in slow solvation. Well, slow solvation has in the last 20-22 years emerged as a marker of bound water as we have said. And what has been shown later on is that you can actually use it by combining with a confocal microscope capable of performing lifetime measurements FLIM. It, this can give you an insight into really small volumes like never before. So, in the next 3 minutes or 4 minutes let me present to you a brief summary of work done in one group that of Professor Kankan Bhattacharya in uh, ISCS in which they used a confocal FLIM setup fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy setup. When I say confocal what it essentially means is this that uh, this is where your sample is right. So, the excitation light is focused on to uh, a particular point in the sample focal point as you know cannot be less than lambda by 2 in diameter that is the diffraction limit. And then there is a dichroic mirror that sends the uh, so this is the laser light this is the fluorescence light the dichroic mirror sends the uh, fluorescence into uh, this objective of the microscope after which the direction takes place. Now, uh, if you have worked with sufficiently small uh, concentrations you can look at single molecules by this technique. So, Suppose you use an excitation wavelength of 400 nanometer, what is the resolution you have 200 nanometer. Now, suppose you use this microscope to study something like a cell, what is the size of a cell? Microns, you can see cells very easily under a not very sophisticated optical microscope, yeah. So, uh, the thing is since the cells are like 20,000, 30,000 times larger than the resolution that we have in confocal microscopy, you have the capability to look at not only the cell as a whole, but also at different parts of the cell. If you have a fluorescent probe that goes and my go binds to a mitochondria, mitochondrion, you can look at mitochondrion selectively. If there is uh, something that goes and uh, binds to some microtubules, then you can look at microtubules selectively. If there is something that will go and bind to say lysosome, you will be able to see lysosomes selectively. And uh, this technique has been used very effectively uh, by groups like for, for example, Professor Yamuna Krishnan's group who migrated from NCBS to U Chicago few years ago, gave a talk in our institute last year. So, one can look at different components of cell by using selectively by using confocal microscopy. Now, if your confocal microscope is capable of measuring lifetimes, you can measure lifetimes at different locations of the cell does not always have to be a cell of anything of that dimension. And if your system is fitted with a grating and detector typically EMCCD, then you can measure fluorescence spectrum as well. In our setup we currently cannot do it. So, if you have an EMCCD and a grating combination as well as a lifetime measurement accessory FLIM, then you can study solvation dynamics in different parts of the cell as well. And that is what has been done by Bhattacharya group, this is one example. 
Uh, what they did is they worked with uh, CHO cell. What is CHO? It's Chinese hamster ovary. The different there are several different cell lines that people work with. This is Chinese hamster uh, ovary. So there you see uh, they use two dyes. One is DCM. This is DCM, and the other is DAPI. This is DAPI. So DCM is known to localize in cytoplasm. We'll not get into the detail of why that. Uh, one can study. DAPI is known to bind to nucleus. So, what you see here is that if you look at the decays, fluorescence decays, they are definitely wavelength dependent. And then if you record the uh, emission spectrum as well, you can get an idea of solvation times in different parts of the cell. Using DCM, you can get the solvation time in cy cytoplasm. Using DAPI, you can get the solvation time in uh, nucleus. Using something else, you can get a uh, lifetime of, of something else. And the good thing is, here, uh, even if there is a distribution of DCM between, say, two different uh, parts of the cell, you can, using confocal microscopy, look at, uh, say, cytoplasm once and record all your data there. Then look at, say, Golgi body another time, record all your data in Golgi body. So, uh, coupling uh, this time resolved emission spectroscopy with microscope gives us this very powerful technique of looking at dynamics in different parts of a very small volume like that of a cell. And this is what a typical confocal image looks like. And here looking at this image, one can identify things like lipid droplets, this is the nucleus, this is a cytoplasm. And recording fluorescence decays at different parts of the cell like this. What Bhattacharya group was able to do is that they were able to work out the C of T's at different parts. You see, this is the decay of C of T in the nucleus, this is the one in cytoplasm, and this is what is there in lipid droplets. So, if you look at the times in bulk water, it is about 1 picosecond, in nucleus, it is about 750 picosecond, cytoplasm a little slower, 1100 picosecond, lipid droplets 3 times slower, 3600 picosecond. Okay. And uh, what has been proposed is that using these you can in fact uh, later on this technique has been expanded to differentiate between say cancer cells and non cancerous cells. So, this is uh, a way in which one can extend this time resolved uh, ultra fast technique to think of applications in biological systems or even in uh, micro heterogeneous materials. I think we will stop here today and next day we will talk about since we are talking about water now, next day we will what we will do is we will talk a little more about water. We are going to revise something that I think we did a little hurriedly, the neighboring's work remember science 2003, science 2005, we are going to talk about that in a little more detail and we will continue with the work from the same group in which they have shown how vibration energy gets redistributed into different uh, modes of water. So, today we talked about liberation and all, we come back to that, but from a different perspective in the next module. And then after that, uh, have I talked about uh, ESIPT at all in this course? Did I talk about accelerated intramolecular proton transfer? Then uh, for the sake of historical accuracy, we will do that since we are talking about photoacids anyway. Then what we will do is we will move over. There is one debate that I would like to present if we get time and that is, uh, okay, maybe we can do that as an extension of uh, ESIPT, ESPT. Then we will move over from molecules to nanoclusters and then nanomaterial.